the last thing I'd like to show off is actually me taking Matplotlib and uh, pandas and doing effectively a, a data analytics. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is a smaller set of a study that I recently done. If you looked on my channel, I have another video on student practice sessions. If you have not and you're curious, you can click on that thing. But the entire idea was, uh, you know, I want to see just how students are practicing during uh, their time on a particular course. So we'll kind of I'm gonna walk through sort of what I did uh, as that process kind of. So the start, I am working off of my import statements. Again, these are just loading in what I plan to be operating with. Uh, there is the mask function that I told you uh, that I like to use in place of the data frame kind of filtering that you can do. This is my you know, cleaning that up way. Uh, I don't think I'm using it in this particular uh, example uh, just because I've stripped out a lot of things, but uh, this is almost like the first thing I do whenever I'm doing a new analytic is just make sure this function is right there. So I, I always throw it to get in there. And then the next little process that I'm doing here is I'm loading in my data set. So uh, just to kind of see that in action, it's just a CSV with a bunch of numbers and uh, particular values going on there. Uh, but the entire idea is I'm utilizing pandas read CSV function to convert this CSV file into a data frame. Uh, this next little portion here is because that created uh, column, if you kind of take a look at it, the issue here is that that is a string. And when I want to do analytics on literally, you know, the time deltas between two rows, so literally these two, I need to have some way to do that. Uh, and this by strings is not going to help. So this is Panda's way happens to have a version where you can take a column and convert it into a date time. I am here specifying which column and this is the format that that string happens to be in. Take it, process it, do turn it into a date frame. And then uh, this last little bit here is save that as the column itself. So replace what was there with this. And then I just have a nice little print statement where I group by the student IDs. Again, grouping by, we'll look at all the unique IDs and then filter all their data into their individual uh, bins, if you will, uh, and produce a list. Uh, so that allows me to, in this case, see, as you can see, if I did a lin, how many students I'm processing. And then I can do something like dot head. This is uh, one of the first things I always typically do when I've loaded in a data frame, just so I can see it. I don't have to jump, like I don't have to go jump on this or jump in Excel. I just have it available. I can see it quite nicely. So then I've just got some basic descriptive statistics going on next for my way of just kind of seeing the data and seeing, since I don't want to print out uh, all of these entries, because uh, you'll see why in a second, this just gives me sort of the number uh, for that. So again, I'm doing that same printing of the unique students. Uh, then I am looking at my data frame and saying, well, how long is it? Just how long is my data frame? And that's how many total actions there are. And then the unique activities of my analysis. So in this case, I see again the 87 students. Uh, there are a total of 17,000 entries uh, are in here. And again, this is why I don't want to print that out. That's a big number. I like that from a teaching perspective, but not from a I need to do analysis perspective. Uh, and then I see the unique uh, events or activities that students are working off of. In this case, these are little shorthand uh, ways to represent each one of the different activities. So for example, TE is representing the typing exercises that you guys are doing for your attendance, uh, but I happen to have a number of diff different activities as well uh, to work off of. So this next section is what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at a particular uh, activity and or I wanted to look at a particular student and see how, how many things they did in a particular session. So just to kind of see it here, I'm looking at the difference between two records. So if I'm at this record, for example, I want to say, well, what's the record before me? 
and specifically when what are the time differences between these two records if they are uh, greater than 60 minutes then I have a new session the student got up walked away ate you know something went to bed because that's greater than 60 minutes hopefully you're sleeping more than just an hour either way so in this case again I'm grouping by the students to separate them out into their nice little bins and then I'm creating a dictionary for sessions again this is my way of uh, just storing individual users and then creating a list of sessions for a particular user. And that's exactly what I do. Again, uh, when we do a group by, it's going to take the unique values of, in this case, user ID, and that's going to be the key. And then data is going to be all of the data associated, all the data entries associated to that user ID. So again, for every user, let me have their user uh, name, uh, user ID, and the data associated to that. And then I'm creating a, an entry in my sessions dictionary for that user. Here is an empty list of sessions that I'm about to start working off of. Uh, then, as you can see, this is where I start building those sessions. Now, this is where I, it's a little on the finicky side with uh, pandas for specifically what I wanted to do. Uh, so in this case, uh, data.iter rows is a way to convert it into just a straight up, here is a loop uh, or here is a list. Uh, and same kind of approach you can see I'm doing, I have to unpack two values, row index and the particular row. That's because this row index, I don't want the ones, but I have to unpack it. And then I want the row. I actually I want the actual physical row. Now that's going to allow me to have a dictionary, just like with our CSV dict reader. So in this case, I grab, say for example, time. I don't think I'm using it, uh, but again, I was. Uh, sometimes it's uh, leftover data from when I was building out the process. So, uh, but the first thing I'm doing is if session does not exist, just this is the first session that I've seen from this student. Just grab it, put it into the session. Otherwise, uh, this is again where I'm doing an analysis. I'm saying uh, look at any two particular sessions. So I'll actually kind of use this as the better example. I'm at this activity. So take a look at created. Now take a look at the last activity that that student did in this session and do a difference between these creatives. How, what's the duration difference between these two uh, sessions? So that's me extracting those out and then calling that a delta. Uh, and then I have extract that by seconds. If that delta is greater than 60 times 60 or uh, 300 and, or 3,600 seconds or a 60 minute cutoff, that session is over and start a new session. If it's not, then you're st it's an activity, they're still working, they're, they haven't ended their session quite yet. Add that, that particular row to this session. So, okay, we go in and then we take those sessions, move on. Now what we get into is this idea of the session counts. That's just checking how many sessions a particular student had. Uh, this order is mostly just so my uh, activities are in a specific order uh, of easiest or most uh, least engaging uh, to most engaging is the terminology that I used in my paper. Uh, but then just here's me taking uh, a data frame, uh, taking a data frame and setting it to those orders. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm going to be adding in. So this is actually an empty dictionary, uh, an empty data frame. Uh, then for every user, for every session of that user, grab out the different activities uh, that that session had, and then uh, create a binary representation of whether or not that activity existed or did not exist in this transaction, uh, transaction or uh, this session. So in this case, uh, again, what we would be seeing is uh, if a student did a typing exercise, uh, that particular value would have a one. Uh, so in this case of this student, we see that they have uh, a bunch of uh, TEs and then PPs for Parsons puzzles. Uh, 
This is all still happening within, I guess, one session, roughly speaking. So we would see that that would be a one and a one. Okay, so I take that, process it, sessions. Oh, I never ran this one. There we are. Now, you can see that this is going to take a second because I'm processing 17,000 rows, but here we go. Uh, so how many total transactions do we have? So of the six, uh, 17,000, we now have reduced that down to 686 individual practice sessions across all students. And just to see sort of what that looks like. Uh, so in this case, for example, this student, this particular time did all the activities all in one session. Uh, that's what I like to see, honestly. So again, now, okay, I've converted, I've made this binary representation of whether or not an activity exists. Uh, here's an example where uh, this particular session didn't have uh, a find a bug. So again, now we're dealing with uh, a factor analysis. And the first thing we have to do is we have to do some adequacy tests. We have to make sure that our data set is uh, worthy of doing a factor analysis. And so again, I'm just doing some quick little, here's some analysis. This is uh, more because the factor analysis has to be in a float. It can't be a number. I originally had these being integers. Um, so this is just conversion uh, and some more debugging that was carried over. Uh, but again, the first one we're going to work off of is something called the Bartlett's test. And the entire idea here is we're just looking at our data and seeing if it is uh, an identity matrix. If it is, you can't do a factor analysis. So this is where I am happening to use a completely foreign uh, library um, called Factor Analyzer, uh, Analyzer to do uh, my uh, Bartlett's uh, sphericity test, uh, if you will. And when we run through it, it gives us our chi-squared and then the p-value. And you can see that's a very small p-value. Uh, and in that case, we happen to have a very, we have a statistically significant uh, data set. Awesome, that means we're good. Now I did add in an additional test because more tests are, are good. Uh, and so the same kind of thing, a KMO is just going to check to see if whether or not our data is good. And as long as it is above a 0 0.6, that's great. Uh, same kind of thing, it happens to, the factor analyzer happens to have that same one. So I run it. Uh, and in this case, as you can sort of see, we got a KMO score of a 0.77. Again, that's above the 6, 0.6 threshold. So again, we're good. So that means now we can do our factor analysis. As the header sort of indicates, we need to specify how many factors that we want to operate from. Factor analysis is going to do dimension reduction. So from our eight variables, we need to condense that down uh, or create new variables from it. So how many do we create? Well, in that case, we have to calculate out eigenvectors and eigenvalues, very similar to a principal component analysis, which I also have a video for. Anyways, from here, I am just following sort of their tutorial and they happen to have this kind of in place uh, for us. And so the first thing I am doing is printing out uh, the different eigenvalues. So you can see I am making it a data frame that's just for my sake, um, but we have, uh, again, those values. Just to see a different variation to this, this is, again, you can use instead of uh, just eigenvalues, using a scree plot will show you sort of the amount of variance and how much more information you get with each additional factor. So uh, you see there's a large jump down uh, in value from uh, one to two factors. That, okay, understandable. That means that we have one that's just like a definitive uh, factor. By doing two, we get, a we get a lot of information as well. Then we, as we get to three, we get not as much, and four, not as much. Again, you can see it slowly goes down over time. Uh, but the last little thing that can help you is seeing what the cumulative variance of these are. And you don't need to worry so much about the uh, warning that's not crashing of the code. That's just, uh, I'm not doing something quite what it wants, but I'm, yeah. The big thing is you can see, I can see based on my different numbers of factors, if I were to do a, a one factor, two factor, three factor, how much 
uh, can I explain from my data? So in this case, uh, with a four factor, I can explain just under 60% of all variance uh, between practice sessions. Okay, so basically what this allows us to do is uh, work off of this. I'm going to use a four factor analysis. Uh, so effectively anything that was above a 0 0.7. So in this case, four. So with that in mind, performing the factor analysis. So this is just a, a little formatting to color uh, my individual cells. This is mostly so um, since I'm building a table, this is going to allow me to sort of stick out what are the important values. Then I'm specifying my uh, factor analysis. I did multiple factor analyses. So this was just my quick way of having one variable, uh, one cell to change. Uh, but in our case, setting it. And then we do our factor analysis. Again, this is where that library that I'm working off of happens to have the factor analysis for me. This is beautiful. I don't have to do the full on math for uh, the factor analysis, which, you know, again, if it's similar to a principal component, we do the correlation, uh, the covariance matrices and everything. It'll take care of that for us. Beautiful. So again, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm running through the factor analysis. Uh, I'm fitting that data uh, to it. So this is sort of building it. And then this is fitting my data to it. Uh, and then I'm building, I'm taking that fitted uh, factor analysis and I'm converting it into a data frame. Again, this is just my way of having a way to uh, very quickly operate from uh, Jupyter with. I am then adding in the events back as a extra column. Um, this is more for, so I don't have to scroll up to see what, you know, what was the uh, third row kind of thing. And then this last little bit here, I am saying, uh, take all of the, uh, I'll even actually, let me hide it and I'll, I'll show sort of why I did it. So again, I take this, I run it. Oh, and then this is the print factor loading. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. And this is just saying, go through those and in particular, uh, set them in a particular way. Oh no, okay, sorry, uh, loadings. So in this case, you can see this is the factor analysis. All right, well, the next little bit that I added in here is this dot round four. That just shortened it, you know, cut down my values a little bit, nothing terribly crazy. But this last little bit here uh, is effectively saying for every one of those numbers, uh, decide whether or not to color in that number. Uh, and that is actually where that function came into play is saying, well, if that value is greater than 0.5 or less than negative 0.5, make it green. Uh, or if it's not that, well, check if it's at least above a 0.4, you know, that occasionally may be indicative of something, uh, and color it yellow. Otherwise, just color it white. And then this is a little bit of um, HTML, CSS kind of going on there. But again, that's just... Uh, how to process the background color. And what this will do is instead of our data sort of looking like this, it'll look like this. Ah, oh, look at that, you can see pretty colors. But the entire idea is now I can see, oh, well, you know, the first factor, uh, I can draw some conclusions based on this. A particular session uh, could be, a, one of the most common sessions was a find the bug, fix the bug self explanation. The next common uh, practice session was a fill in the blank Parsons puzzle and output prediction. The third most common session was a typing exercise. Uh, this was not a, an attendance uh, style class. It was just another activity. And then the most, the uh, last most common was self explanation into a uh, coding exercise. So as you can see, oh, what do you know? I can do factor analysis and I have explained out my data. This last little bit is, uh, again, if I'm dealing with a much larger data set, uh, again, I'm only working with um, eight particular uh, variables and only four factors, but if I'm dealing with something much larger, uh, it may be a little more difficult. So this little portion here is uh, just go through the particular uh, listings, uh, the loadings in my factor analysis, and just grab the ones that are the high loadings and the moderate loadings and just have them print out uh, for me 
Uh, so has no observable states uh, or has high or moderate levels uh, for these particular variables. So again, I take that and oh, what do you know? Factor one has high loadings for fill in the blanks and find the uh, fix the bugs. Uh, I didn't do you know the yellows as well, but that's more just like because this is uh, a quick explanation for my sake. Uh, but again, as you can see, this is a, a full on uh, example of utilizing again pandas, numpy, libraries, matplotlib to do something scientific, a data analytic and in this case, a factor analysis to study how students behaved in my class.